Um, I'm off doing something new. It's cloud and big data. Um, it's redundant, massive arrays of cheap machines trying to do something useful. Um, there's a bunch of marketing slides I'll burn through quick, but it's, this is a new world for me, so I'm, I'm playing around with a completely different space. Um, basically, something's happened in the last decade. Uh, disk drives got really cheap, and people started capturing all the possible data they could without much regard to the quality of the data. So they captured a lot of junk data, output of machine logs, um, sensor, raw sensor data, anything, everything, click streams that they could get. Um, and they were using Hadoop. They are using Hadoop to do it. Basically, it's the free version of Google file system. And now there are farms of terabytes to petabytes of this cheap junk data out in the world. And people want to do something with it. So um, what's been happening is people have been using MapReduce on Hadoop to get at this data. So this turns out to be very robust at scale, where scale is measured with a typical Hadoop cluster is more like 10 to 40 machines, but it works up to thousands of machines and, and actually our production people are running it on thousands of machines. So very large. The downside, of course, is you have to program in MapReduce to get at this data, which turns out to be pretty complicated to manage and maintain and program. Um, and it's also very batch oriented so that you get nothing in four hours, but maybe everything in five hours. You know, however long it takes to get to the very bitter end of the job is what it takes to get to the final output. Okay, so there's a market there for people who want to do something with their data and are tired of sort of the complexities and the issues involved with MapReduce. Um, how are the data sitting on, uh, on HDFS, Hadoop file systems? So you just have to live with that. Um, you're not moving the terabytes and petabytes of data around. Um, but a better programming model. And so this is something where people are looking for ways to uh, write quick jump, junk apps and fire them off on a pile of data and get an answer back on some reasonable time frame. Something that's easy to set up and manage and uh, you know, uh, uh, plug and play, zap and go, but I've got on the far side of you know, what I'm writing code for, it's a farm of machines with terabytes of data on them. Right? So uh, what, if I look out in the data centers in the world, what I see is there's a lot of these cheap large disks I talked about, but they're all attached to a sort of fairly modern multi-core x86s, typically with a lot of gigabytes of RAM, uh, and these are all racked and stacked, so they all have fast networks, highly reliable in data center, good networks. They're all running Linux, they typically all have Java installed. They're also running fairly cheap x86s, which typically will fail occasionally, or have giant Java GC pauses, or have all sorts of other <coughs> issues. Um, so basically, I'm looking at a redundant array of inexpensive nodes. So I, what I want to do is make some sort of RAID-like structure for computation, instead of for just for disk access. Right? Some sort of single system image where I get silent recovery from a failed node. I'm going to have variable amounts of parallelism available to me over time. So I can't just say, stripe this array across all these nodes, because that implies a fixed count, a fixed striping. And I'm going to have a variable count of nodes over time. Things are going to come and go. Real, things are going to fail. I'm going to have to rerun, whatever. So I'm looking for a programming model that lets me work with a large rack or series of racks of machines uh, talking to these terabytes and petabytes of data. right? So I'm starting out with uh, distributed unblocking hash map. It's pretty semi-classic distributed hash table kind of thing, peer-to-peer, -peer, no master. You spread your, your keys for your hash map around the cloud. There's some sort of distribution function that gets everything sprayed about. And uh, nodes can drop in and out, and the hash function changes to match. It means keys and, uh, and values have to move as things come and go. Um, it turns out that in order to get performance out, I'm going to let my keys all be cached locally, but they might only appear on some of the replicas, and all the nodes know where everything is. So if a key misses locally, this is the magic of a distributed hash table, I know exactly who's got it. Uh, and so one UDP packet later, I can go get the data if it fits in a packet, and if it doesn't, then obviously it starts streaming. But I can go to the owner of the data in one packet uh, without any further centralized control over things. And then of course I can write to any node and then it will get sprayed around the cloud to where it needs to go in the end. <coughs> so what I've got here then is a pile of machines that are talking to each other, like they're a key value store. Um, 
but most of my apps need some other stuff. So you know, bulk a pen with some sort of fast random read. They also need streaming read, but they'll need random read as well. And it's write only, it's actually write once data. So th there's, there's no changing in the old key values uh, of the old stuff, except for control flow that you need around the computation setup. So there's some pieces of this that are not just go read piles and piles of data or go write streaming in. There's a bunch of complicated control flow logic floating around for when you're managing uh, a distributed computation here. So it turns out I have some sort of memory model whether I like it or not. And the memory model, so the memory model is being used to control my computations mostly, but I need to know what it is. Um, and so it's the visibility rules. And uh, having lived the JMM for years on end, I know that what it is, and I know that it's well understood by lots and lots of people. So I can say JMM and people in this room know what it, mean, what it means. So this is unlike most of the other key value stores out there in that I'm going to promote a very uh, well understood memory model. It's not eventual consistency. It's, it's much stronger than that, but it's also going to let me run much faster because I don't have to do uh, voting on replicas or any number of other things, I'm going to have a very efficient way to go play this game. Um, and I'm going to play the same kind of games that the hardware cache coherence people do, but doing it on the network scale. So basically, there's a normal key value put git, which are basically weakly ordered. Um, and they're going to be strongly ordered relative to one node. This is more like a Java thread now. So a machine becomes like a Java thread. He's, pile, he's firing off key value loads and stores just like a load and store on a CPU would. Um, and they're unordered relative to other nodes unless you put in a volatile, which will force ordering at the expense of slowness. Um, you do get agreements on final values, but if racing people are writing pounding, 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 there's some random arbitrary winner picked in the end, um, although in between people might see different values, just like the Java memory model here. And I'll need to add a missity because it's just a, it's a use case everyone needs for. <clears throat> so what do I got? Um, right now, I have a distributed key value store. I have some sort of automatic replication repair persistence stuff that I'm actually using for my internal control not to actually hold the data. Um, and some sort of fairly easy management, one jar, install, deploy, distributed dashboard kind of stuff. I can see all the nodes, watch them come and go, see how busy they are, that kind of stuff. And it's pretty fast. Um, reads and writes are all cached locally. I can Pile reads in or writes in an individual node, and he'll forward them to the proper final place for them. Um, most of my operations are all like a single UDP packet. It's really quick to do this kind of stuff. And having this kind of a framework, what can I do with it? Well, what I want to do is get to reliable computation. And what kind of computations can be reliable? What if we expect nodes to fail? So the, 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 you know, the, the sort of Com the idea here is that you're charging along, computing some random thing, and somebody falls off. A CPU died in your multi-core machine. Is this like a death wish? For most machines, if a CPU dies, the OS locks up and you're dead, and, and you power cycle, and you try again, and the application survives because it's spread on multiple nodes. So people have been writing distributed machines with reliable computation for a while now. We just call them application servers, for instance. And the way that's done, typically, is there's some sort of checkpointing, or transaction, if you like, and re-execute if a failed transaction happens, right? This is sort of tried and true. And the user has to come along and define what's a checkpoint, what's a transaction, what's the unit of atomic computation that succeeded, and then it go to the next computation, right? Um, but I also want to do some sort of massively parallel computation, mostly because I have a massively parallel data set that I'm working with. I'm looking at terabytes of really low quality junk data. You know, it's ASCII files I have to parse to get the numbers out and stuff like that. It's not Fortran style, you know, oil field exploration data. It's, it's just log file clickstream stuff. So I'm going to do a lot of stuff on this <coughs> data that's all like dumbly in parallel. And I come to fork join. So what is fork join? Forget distributed fork join. What is fork join? So this people like, so how many people here have, have played with fork join? How many people have played with fork join? Ooh, about half. That's pretty good. Okay, so it's a parallel programming paradigm, right? Recursive descent, design, divide and conquer. It turns out that it has fairly good load balancing properties um, because you work steel to migrate work to uh, CPUs that are idle from machines, machines that are busy, CPUs that are busy. And it typically gives good cache behavior. It, it, it by default lands into a category of algorithms called cache oblivious algorithms 
Um, the recursive descent typically blocks your computation in such a way that your blocks eventually, their powers of two smaller and smaller and smaller until suddenly they fit in a cache. Uh, and then you get your good cache behavior, right? So you get a big task broken up in lots of little jobs. So distributed fork join is the same thing, run distributed. So a, a fork join task is essentially a continuation of a logarithmic sized program chunk. It's do this on this giant array, oh that's too big, so we cut it in half and I got two halves and I got quarters and I got eights and something gets small enough I'm going to run locally, right? So I get these logarithmic sized program chunks. And every time I run a chunk, I get some sort of result out. Maybe it's a logarithmic sized answer, or maybe it's just a roll up of all the unique words in the stupid word count example you see all the time. Um, and then eventually there's some sort of join step to merge these two half size chunks and some one, one larger chunk. And you get larger and larger answers until your answer is complete, whether the answer is a large answer or just uh, run over a large pile of data. And the results are put in a future. It's a thing that you can pull results out later when they're ready. Basically, it's a checkpoint. It's a piece of computation that's done now. And that is a thing that's easy to pass around from JVMs. Basically, if I call it another key in my key value store, for the act of doing some sort of compute, I get a value which I can put in the, in the reliable key value store, and now I have a piece of a computation already done. So, you know, it's, it's this sort of notion. Some sort of big task splits into two smaller ones, and I pass around keys for this task, and one node starts one task, and one node starts another, and we claim, say, it dies halfway through. So node A finishes and gets an answer, which he pushes back to the store, he goes out and looks for the computation for two and discovers that it's not done yet. It's, an, it's a waiting to be completed computation. He can now pick it up and run with it. And he gets the one and the fact that two died doesn't end the entire job. It just means that somebody else redid that logarithmic size chunk of, of computation there. Um, so more on fork join here. So it's a, it's a nice programming style for expert programmers. It's very expressive and very flexible for doing big data or big parallel arrays or graph computations or a variety of other kinds of programming styles. And it gets you this, this good load balance properties, cache reuse properties, cache oblivious algorithms. It's kind of nice in a lot of things. It gives me a constant uh, log size checkpoint. So I get a steady stream of logarithmic size chunks of work that have been completed. So if somebody was to fail out, I, I have you know, everything that's been done up to that point for, for whoever was working on the pieces that fell over them. It's a nice model for experts to use. But maybe it's too low level for general use. So I want an easier model because I want to target more people than the people in this room. Um, you know, I want to run general Java, except I want to run it at scale and maybe with multiple users on a farm of machines that are doing some sort of computation analytic stuff. So it's not really general Java. So I have to do stuff like if you make static globals in your program, those are not global on a distributed cloud unless I need to make, unless I make them global by doing some sort of uh, global computation or make them user local in that if I'm running a program and you're running a program and somebody else is running on the same cloud, they're not talking to each other via globals accidentally. Those are private to a user. System out, error, exit, refer to one task, one job, even if it's distributed. Like system.exit, if I call it, I don't want it to kill my JVM. I want it to kill my task I'm running on this cloud of JVMs. Does that make sense? I'm doing system.out, I don't want all the output from everyone else's jobs intermingled with mine. I want it to go to my one console for my output. Right? So I'm talking about a farm of machines where system out is now a distributed notion across all of them. Syntax error for JNI calls. If I'm running a MacBook and I make a JNI call and I'm backed onto a cloud of machines that are running Linux, uh, it probably doesn't make sense to go run the JNI call at all, right? <coughs> Within the computation, there's other things I want to do. I want to know my allocations are thread local or node local because I can't refer to them across machines and so on and so forth. Basically, there's a bunch of games I have to play to make it run general Java in a distributed way. And I'm going to play games with auto parallelization. Um, basically, simple outer loops or loop nests can be easily parallelized. 
Uh, it, you know, auto parallelization is an unsolved problem of the last 40 years, but I'm a hardcore compiler guy and I got the right kind of training and we've hired some other people who, who also have the right kind of training. And most of the people who do this kind of work with the data, the large data sets, are doing embarrassingly parallel stuff because they have embarrassingly parallel data. The data is all this uh, huge volumes of low quality data. You're going to do the same damn thing a billion times over. You can parallelize it. So in insert my distributed fork join calls into the loop nests. Um, blow out a syntax error if I can't parallelize your code. Basically, the thought means that if I can't run it in parallel, it's going to run 100x slower, and that's a syntax error. It's as good as dead, right? If, it, if, it, if the time to run goes from one hour to one week, it, you're, you're going to consider it a fail, right? So this, this has to be a syntax error if I can't parallelize. And what I'm headed for here is what happened to the vectorizing compiler experience um, in, the, in the 70s, in the 80s which was basically programmers learned how to write vectorizable code because the compiler would tell them, I can't vectorize your code. And if you can't vectorize your code, it's 100x slower, and so it's like, you know, it's not going to work. Um, if you want tomorrow's weather today, and your program runs 100 times slower, suddenly you're going to get tomorrow's weather next month, and that's no good. So people learned how to write parallel code, vectorizable code, and I'm thinking people can learn to write distributable parallel code, the same kind of game. <clears throat> There's a bunch of other ease of use stuff going around. Um, REST API to talk to this thing. Basically, I have a browser and it reads URLs and I can type commands at it, uh, doing things like submitting a job or just querying the, the KB store or viewing progress of jobs or, or firing results in and out via curl scripts or Excel or whatever. Um, and mostly, plain Java just runs. Uh, which is actually kind of sweet. Um, I've done that a number of times. I've taken some piece of Java code doing some interesting analytics things and just dropped it in and had it go. Oops. Probably. Well, here. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, so, some parallel Java. Somebody writes, you know, I have a collection of a list of strings, which might be very, very large, say larger that fits on a single machine, maybe larger that fits on a single disk. Right, so very large set of strings. And I write a for loop and do some filter and atomic update or whatever. I'm looking, I write serial looking code that I can distribute, and I can distribute this. I can run this distributed at scale. Same with this, this is the first pass of a linear regression and then the second, third passes look similar. I write for i equals one to n, do something on some arrays, accumulate some results. That's automatically distributable. <coughs> Runs at scale where scale's been 10 to 20 machines, but on that order of magnitude. And so n is larger than what will fit in the, in the memory on one machine. Um, so the data, as I said before, is all in HDFS. So we, we support HDFS directly. Um, and that is, in the Java code I write, I have a KV store. So there's a thing called a key. If the HDF files, HDFS files are keys already, I can just refer to them directly and say, give me a, a new key of HDFS file name, and that's already an indirect pointer to what might be a terabyte file out there. Um, and I can pass it into my bulk and parallel ops. Um, this is something I'm working on. MapReduce will get supported directly. Um, basically, there's a trivial translation from MapReduce OBS to distributed fork join, except instead of having one big map per node, there's going to be zillions of tiny maps and, and power of two sized reduced steps. So it's a slightly different breakdown on, on MapReduce. It's not directly MapReduce. We'll run MapReduce directly, but the performance implications are going to be different because it's, it's a different set of uh, how the breakdown goes. Um, so where we're at now, we have a distributed KB store. Um, it's got this fast, simple, and coherent model. I am getting uh, 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 the right kind of coherency out of a thing with, sim with one UDP packet for reads and writes everywhere. And of course, I can cache locally and still get the correct coherence out. So you have that kind of goodness. Uh, unlike other people, I'm using UDP for the control plane and TCP for bulk transfers between nodes. When you, know, when you have to move data, TCP is sort of the right way to do it. Um, and I got my basic distributed fork join working here. Um, but in progress, I say distributed fork join. I am pushing work across nodes, but I'm not cro uh, load balancing yet. Um, we're doing the compiler ops by hand, but we do have compiler people in house. And I've scaled out to about 20 nodes is the obvious easy point to go to now, and I haven't pushed it beyond that. Um, but this is sort of in the sweet spot of the standard cluster size. Um, 
Basically, I'm looking for making a programming model for programming on a rack of machines. So bulk and parallel by default, uh, replicate repair computation because these guys do belly up on you. Um, some sort of consistency model, I want to head for the JMM, I'm going to get the JMM if you ask for it directly, um, otherwise you'll get a fairly weak thing. Well, it's just, you know, non-volatile ops with a normal. Um, it'll be weaker than an x86 model, but uh, it'll match this with people when people ask for volatiles and stuff. Basically, it almost runs plain Java. It's very close to running plain Java. Uh, directly read and write HDFS, including at large scale, and I'm headed for sort of large scale analytics for the piles and piles and piles of read-only data. Append-only is the incoming stream, and the other side people run read-only on these giant slabs of data, and try to do it for people who are like non-experts. So yes, I'm having a blast. I'm back to coding reasonable, 2,000 to 3,000 lines of code a week, uh, minus whenever I lost time for my crazy vacation. We're putting stuff together. We have a lot of cool people involved, um, including Jan Vitex in this room. He, he claims he's not an employee, he's a consultant, but he's coding full time. But he has to be in, on the advisor for make Purdue happy. Okay, that's it. <laughs>